being asked to address, or what our panelists are being asked to address, is the question of, uh, okay, we know what's happening to television news, so what should, if anything, be done about it? I'm Warren Alney. I spent uh, 25 years in local television news here in Los Angeles. I now do a program on public radio called Which Way LA. I'm glad I wasn't on the last uh, panel. I would have had to apologize for 25 years of uh, the time that I spent in local news. I uh, commend all of you for being willing to uh, devote an entire day to what is really a very important subject, it seems to me, but one which uh, can be painful for serious people to talk about. So um, congratulations to all of you for hanging in. We have a very distinguished panel of people. Let me briefly uh, introduce them all. We'll hear uh, uh, the answers that they choose to give to our very broad uh, question of what, what ought we to do, and then we will press on from there. And we do hope to have questions from you in the audience, and I think that uh, uh, Jeff himself is going to wield the microphone. Yeah, there he is, and uh, willing to do that. Uh, Ken Aletta has written the New Yorker's Annals of Communications column since uh, October of 1992. He's covered a variety of subjects, including the lucrative fees that are paid to journalists who give speeches, particularly television journalists, I might add. Not paying these guys they are. We're not, pay not that I know of, he's not paying me. <laughs> The, um, he's profiled some of the most powerful people in this business, Rupert Murdoch, Barry Diller, Herbert Allen, Edgar Bronfman, John Malone. Uh, he's talked about some of the important issues, uh, including those that we're, that one that we're talking about today, the, uh, the state of, of news. He, um, previous to going to The New Yorker, was a weekly columnist at The New York Daily News from 1977 until 1993. And he's written six books, including Three Blind Mice, How the TV Networks Lost Their Way, Greed and Glory on Wall Street is another of his publications. Stephen Brill is the chairman and CEO of Brill Media Ventures, LP. He also is the founder and editor-in-chief of Content Magazine. Prior to Bill Brill Media Ventures, he was the chairman and CEO of American Lawyer Media. He served and uh, was founder of and uh, president and CEO and editor-in-chief of Courtroom Television Network and editor-in-chief of American Lawyer as well. Michael Schutzen is a professor of communications and sociology at the University of California in San Diego. He's the author of Discovering the News. Advertising the Uneasy Persuasion, Watergate in American Memory, and he's co-editor of Reading the News. His most recent work, uh, works include Rethinking Popular Culture and The Power of News, certainly something we're talking about today. He teaches courses on the news media, on political communication, and on the sociology of culture as well. So this is a great group, and I'm most uh, pleased to be, uh, be a part of it. Somebody want to give him a hand? Go ahead. <laughs> An, an, an anticipatory uh, celebration of, the, uh, of what is to come. So somebody said uh, in the last panel, uh, are we doomed uh, to television news as we know it? Is there anything we can do, was the, uh, the plaintive uh, cry that I heard when I first sat down here. So let's start there. Uh, is there anything to do? Is there anything that should be done? And I'll go alphabetically again. Ken Aletta, you first. you could discuss what might be done, you have to look at the business uh, proposition that you're dealing with. Uh, it's not just what, what the, panel, the previous panel was talking about, which is increased competition. Um, it's also that the audience has changed. The people who own these journalistic institutions, by and large, are large companies, large companies in which these journalistic institutions play a smaller and smaller role and don't contribute the same profit margins as, say, local TV stations do, which contribute roughly between 40 and 50 cents on every dollar they take in of revenue is pure profit. Um, and they don't contribute what cable does or what some of the programming or software or other parts of the business do. So increasingly what these companies, which are public, do is they look to their audience being Wall Street. What is the shareholder value we're getting, which is the same question that a widget company asks. So if you're, going to, if you're going to request them or demand them to change, you somehow have to deal with this equation. How do you get them to change their value system, which basically is what matters is, how do I maximize my profits to shareholders? That, they say, is their fiduciary responsibility. And we come back and we say, and I think probably you'll find a, a course uh, on this panel, 
say that, look, it, that is not your only responsibility. You have some public trust obligations. You have some responsibilities to your community. You have some responsibility to employees. It's a multiple. But you have to first address that question of how do you, Mr. Shareholder or Mr. Owner or Mr. CEO, uh, change your value system or at least alter it some way. And among the ways you might do that is to shame them. That is to say, one of the things I love doing as a journalist, and I, one of the things I look forward to when Steve Brill starts his new magazine content, is just sticking a, a tape recorder or a pad in someone's face and say, now, would you tell me why you air Jerry Springer's show? And I love doing that. I had a conversation with Frank Biondi two weeks ago, who's the CEO of Universal MCA, which owns that show. I said, Frank, now tell me again, why is it that you put that crappy show on the air that you wouldn't let your nine-year-old, if you had one, watch? And I think we have to do more of that and, and, and remind these people that there is a disconnect between what they do in their business life and what they do, or in fact, the product they produce and its impact on the community. But it's going to be real hard going because of that first and fundamental issue for them. What do you do when he says St uh, Jerry Springer is the leading program in the United States at 11 o'clock? Um, aren't you embarrassed, Frank? <clears throat> Steve Brill. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up Most of the entities Ken pointed out, talking about, are publicly owned. And it's, a, it's actually a very interesting, clear responsibility to have. If you open up the, um, the annual report, for example, of uh, the General Electric Corporation, or CBS, or, um, or Disney, the first sentence of that report, or maybe the second, always says, our goal is to maximize value for our shareholders. Now, how many of you here are um, have money that's in some kind of a pension fund or with some kind of um, 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 investment advisor in some way or another. You all have pension funds or something? If you get a report uh, next quarter or, or six months from now that says that your pension fund owned X and the average for you know, the Dow Jones or something else uh, was twice X, you're going to say, what kind of idiots do I have running my pension fund? And if you write them a letter and they write back and say, well, you see, when we invested for you, we didn't tell you this, but we invested in a lot of companies that say their goal is to maximize value for shareholders, but we also invested in a couple of companies where the management said they were willing to try to make as much money as they could, but they also had some other things they wanted to do. Um, one of them wanted to be very active in the arts in, um, in Florida. Another one is really hung up about the values of journalism and their owned and operated television stations make only a 32% profit against a 50% uh, margin. And we know you understand that, right? You do understand that, don't you, with your pension funds? The answer is you don't understand it. And the answer is that you really shouldn't understand it. And the answer is that um, the fiduciary obligation of anyone who has a publicly owned company is you're, you're taking money from strangers who are buying your stock and you're promising them that you know, consistent with law and, and you know, all prevailing standards of law and what's appropriate, you're going to maximize value. That is your promise when you go public. What's different today than, uh, than many decades ago is a lot of these companies that are now public were private. The New York Times company, for example, the Washington Post company, while they're public, the controlling shareholders um, are not subject to public pressure because they have two forms of stock. The Graham family has one type of stock which has the voting control and everybody else has another type. Now in any other industry, uh, when uh, reporters hear about that, in any other company they say this is outrageous, this violates all standards of shareholder democracy. The fact is all of us on this panel and probably most of you in the audience kind of like that idea when it comes to the Grahams or the Salzburgers because as a result of that they are more immune than others from the kinds of pressures we're talking about. Um, to give you another example, I mean, I'm starting um, an entity where I own, I literally own, a majority of the equity. And the partners that I have who've invested have been told, because there's only three of them, it's easy to tell them, um, I'm going to do everything I can to maximize the economic success of this thing consistent with the following values. And you have to understand year by year I may not maximize the profit, but I have a pretty good record of doing this with these values. But if you don't want to go on for that ride, don't do it. 
When you buy stock on the stock market, you don't see too many prospectuses that say that. Now, what's the answer to that? Well, look at the alternatives. One alternative is that the government can own media. And I don't think anybody wants that. Another alternative is you can have charity news organizations. Um, you know, PBS and, and charitably owned newspapers and magazines. I think those are, are miserable, terrible alternatives because they never really do good news, if you ask me. And second, they're beholden to a whole different set of interests and a whole different kind of pressure from the people who contribute to them. So that's not a terribly good alternative. Um, what I'm starting to think about is the economic model as an alternative, and it starts with something that Ken said, and that is uh, the power of embarrassment. Um, one of the goals of our magazine is to embarrass people a lot who are doing not good things and to praise people a lot who are doing good things. For example, the woman who was on from KMBC said they respond to all telephone calls. That's just bullshit. They don't do that. Everybody knows that. If you call that channel, because we've had reporters who've tried, we've had reporters already who've tried, and make a complaint about something that's on the air, they don't respond. You get a form letter. They don't respond. We're going to embarrass them with that. Now I can't do it anymore because I spilled the beans, but there are a lot of other channels where we can. The fact is that um, the power of embarrassment, as Ken puts it, can be pretty heavy. But I think it even goes a little further than that. I think that the key in a, you know, I'm in a world where there are so many media outlets, where there's so much competition, brand names really count. And to the extent that embarrassment tarnishes a brand name, it lowers the value, economics, the value of that entity. And to the extent that doing good things helps a brand name, it enhances the value. I'll give you examples. Um, and actually, NBC is a good example. A lot of what's really terrific about NBC has rubbed off and has enabled NBC to build all kinds of ancillary products using the NBC name. That's the good news. The bad news is that I perceive that they're starting to water down the value of their core brand name in news by mixing um, Geraldo in with Tom Brokaw in, and, and with uh, their regular news operation in the name of you know, uh, the S word. You know, their idea of you know, synergy is putting you know, Geraldo with, uh, with Brokaw and with Claire Shipman and everybody else. I think ultimately that, while it will deliver a short-term hit, it helps things short-term, long-term, that kind of thing might erode the brand name. I think that um, uh, the LA Times, I think it's a terrific thing that you have someone in there who's the CEO, at least in theory, it is a terrific thing, that you have a CEO who has said, what I'm going to do is take this core product, the LA Times newspaper, and I'm not going to run from this core product, I'm going to try to figure out a way to make this core product work better. And at least in terms of what he said, I'm not going to do it in a way that waters down the brand name of this product. And in that sense, don't, you know, don't mistake a change in structure, i.e., more involvement with people on advertising, talking to people about editorial stuff. I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as everybody has integrity about it. That's not a problem. But what he has said is the core product is going to get better. Let me interrupt you. I, I want to uh, exercise my responsibility here Please. to... Uh, I was just finishing. Okay, go, go ahead. Finish up if you want. <laughs> the only thing I'm saying is ultimately the marketplace, if more people are engaged, as our magazine hopes to be, uh, hopes to start, in really embarrassing in sort of the economic sense, them tarnishing brands that should be tarnished and polishing brands that should be, po uh, uh, that should be polished, you can show people who have a business motive that this is the best long-term business. Okay. Professor uh, Schutzen, you're up. Okay. A uh, couple of remarks. Uh, first is that in trying to change the, the, the new system as it stands, uh, it seems we at least have to begin with mod modest objectives, I think. Um, News and entertainment have always been mixed, and not all of those to be taking part in American democracy. And further, that for that group, white males of property, they didn't expect them to read the news. 
what the property white male who was participating in the political system was supposed to do was to judge as best he could uh, the character of locals running for office. Judge them, make sure that they were not tyrants or potential demagogues, send them off to Congress and let them do their business. Let them do their business and then evaluate it two years down the road, not follow it every day in the newspaper because the newspaper wasn't covering it anyway. And besides, what could the individual really know? This was, the, this was a view of even Thomas Jefferson, even sort of the, some of the most radical, said, you, know, said you, you in Virginia or Massachusetts don't know the range of things that confront someone in Congress. You can't, you can't judge that. Uh, let them, you send someone good there and let them do the business. Okay, so. Uh, Things changed after that. We became a democracy after that. Um, it's not that there's nothing new under the sun, but if we think back to the beginning, uh, we should be, have some modesty about what we can do with the news media. Let me give one more example, more contemporary, uh, treading on, on territories. Uh, Steve Brill knows much better than, than I. There was a newspaper story some years back about Judge Wapner. Uh, day in court, and what people got from watching Judge Wapner. And this was in interviews with people who, who were running small claims courts in, I think, LA and San Diego. And one of the judges said, we can tell when people come in the small claims court whether they watch Judge Wapner or not. How? The people who watch television bring in a document. The people who don't watch television don't know that you're supposed to bring in some documentary evidence to support your case. They don't know that it then becomes my word against his word. Judge Wapner, it seemed to me, was doing very good civic education on this entertaining television program. But think about how limited an education that was. What, what a small step uh, t for mankind it was to bring in a document when you go into small claims court. But it takes hard work to do even that. OK, so a as someone far from the business, I'm not going to pronounce a lot about what, um, you know, what, you're, what you should do to, to change everything. Um, but let me make a, a couple of remarks. Um, can we change organizations? Can we change the public? Th those would be two, two reasonable um, places to start. Changing organizations, uh, Ken and Steve have been talking about, are there, are there ways in which the power of public embarrassment could really make a difference? Um, uh, I, I, and I, I, I think that's a good way to go. And I think um, public embarrassment can make a difference. However, um, it's perhaps more difficult to embarrass people in the media than it is to embarrass most others. Why? Uh, because the people in the media don't have face-to-face -face clients. I mean, em embarrassment is, it, you can embarrass me in class. I come in unprepared to teach uh, on a Wednesday morning, and my students, I see them face-to-face, -face, they know that. The same with a doctor, the same with a lawyer, the same with a minister, the same with all kinds of service professionals. They have a face-to-face -face relationship with something like a client. You have tenure, you don't have to worry so much. But, but, the, but there's power, in, the power of embarrassment is, is a face-to-face -face power, and most journalists are quite remote from the people they, who are doing the judging, their, their audiences. Um, so, so there's some difficulty about that, that level of attack. Um, on the other hand, there's difficulty in changing the people. Uh, in the last panel said, well, aggressive media literacy would be a good way to go. I think it could make a little difference. I think there should be aggressive media literacy uh, efforts. At the same time, uh, uh, my understanding of things says that that's only going to make a very little difference. Um, if you want to get people to uh, have safer, if we, if we want to improve public health or public safety, we can have lots of campaigns that tell people to wash their hands. Uh, before they eat. That will help a little, but it will be much more helpful to have safe city water supplies. We can tell people uh, to uh, be defensive drivers 
or to buckle up, but it will be, do much more good to enforce on Detroit the requirement that they have seat belts in the cars. Um, that, that some kind of socialized or structural reforms, it seems to me, have done more for public health, have done more for public education, and if we can conceive of what they might be, would do more for the media than person-by-person -person education. Um, and let, let one last remark here uh, about what, what might those things be. Um, you know, I, I'm not inside the business, so I don't know, but what if, what, it seems to me in, in Los Angeles or any other city that we now have great competition among lots of different news organizations for disseminating the news, but relatively little uh, competition for gathering the news. We still rely on the Metropolitan Daily Newspaper in most institutions, in, in most cities. Um, that Metropolitan Daily Newspaper has two audiences. One, the people who subscribe to it, and the other is all the other news media in town who are deeply dependent on it. What happens if that newspaper starts thinking about its two audiences? Are there ways it would change its practices? Would the LA Times reporter, I don't know, maybe this is already done, would the LA Times reporter do a video takeout uh, on every news story and provide it to the local television stations? Um, would that LA Times reporter um, uh, do briefings for the television stations. What, what, I don't know. Uh, I'm thinking about what, can you change, can you look to the strength, which is Metropolitan Daily Newspapers, I think still, in news gathering, and see if you can adjust it in some way so that it's serving the servers. Okay, everybody wants to get into the act. L let me uh, just say, it seems to me that <laughs> beginning where we did, we did beg one question, which is that if we want to see change in the news, what, do we, what changes do we want to see? What, what's the model for a better product than the one we're looking at? I hope we'll address that, that question. I do want to ask one question, however, of those who want to uh, operate by shaming um, these institutions. If, as you said, Ken, a lot of the uh, concentration of ownership is such that you're now dealing with these enormous organizations, how are you going to get a forum big enough where you can embarrass them on a scale I'll, I'll that's going to make an impression? I'll, I'll give you, I, I mean, I totally disagree with the, some of the things you said. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, I mean, the notion that you can't shame these people like there's some faceless person you never see, Citizen Kane, is, is poppycock. I mean, for instance, Interscope Records. Time Warner owned 50% uh, of Interscope Records, which were, uh, you know, makes rap music, made rap music. Um, and, and there was, if you remember, Bill Bennett and Dolores Tucker uh, combined to, to protest that this was anti-feminine, uh, anti-women, uh, pro-violence, uh, promoting cop killing, et cetera, et cetera. Time Magazine tried to defend it. Uh, they went at them very aggressively, and some people, myself included, wrote about it and actually printed some of the lyrics. In fact, one of the things I learned later is we printed the lyrics of one of the songs in The New Yorker, and Ford Motor Company pulled out its ads in The New Yorker for an entire year, which, to The New Yorker's credit, they never told me about, because they didn't like the curse words in it, but that's the music, and the music was quite violent. The truth of the matter is that Interscope Records was making a fortune for Time Warner, uh, and yet Time Warner sold Interscope Records because Jerry Levin and the other executives were shamed uh, and embarrassed among their friends that this was going on. It is, it is one of several examples me, that one could think of. It's more than just shame and embarrassment. And, and I'm reminded of that when you said something about how you don't get to confront you don't have this one-to-one -one relationship. I'm looking at this, and we're, we're doing a consumer magazine. And the way I keep talking to writers that we're hiring is that we are looking at a consumer product. And we are looking for good consumer products and products that have defects. And if we tell people who are, we're writing about nonfiction media, all varieties of nonfiction media. If you tell people that this product is defective, i.e. it's not nonfiction, and this one isn't, uh, you're doing almost traditional consumer reporting. Let me give you one specific example. Suppose you could identify a publishing house that publishes nonfiction books that aren't nonfiction. Indeed, I think something like three or four of the ten books right now on, on New York Times bestsellers, the top ten, 
have been written about in the New York Times as being not nonfiction, even though they're called nonfiction. Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is one of them, and uh, the Perfect Storm is another one. Well, suppose we, we started a discussion, uh, one of our reporters today, with the editors of all the book reviews in the country, the major book reviews, and we said, what, how do you decide whether to list a book as nonfiction or fiction? And they said the only thing we expected them to say is, well, the way the publisher labels it. And we said, well, is that the standard your newspaper uses for everything else? And he said, hmm, that's a good question. Well, suppose the New York Times Book Review stops automatically labeling a nonfiction book as nonfiction, or suppose they say at the top, purported nonfiction for these books. That will raise a question about this consumer product. I'm Simon Schuster. I'm selling a book. I'm saying to you, this is nonfiction, but it's not nonfiction. That's a consumer fraud. So how do you apply that then to news? I just did. Nonfiction books are supposed to be news. Uh, uh, by the same token, we intend to start grading the major newspapers around the country on several different characteristics. Their, their accuracy, the candor with which they make, uh, uh, the candor with which they admit mistakes, how actively they seek out mistakes and try to correct them. Um, uh, I'm an overall a sense of uh, the breadth of their coverage, but we're going to you know we're going to have a rating system, and it's going to be totally wrong, and everybody's going to attack it, and the only thing it's going to be better than is the rating system that's now in place because there isn't one, and we'll get better at it, and in 10 or 15 years we may even get good at it, uh, but the fact is if if we start to do that, and if other people start to copy us and do that, this whole notion just because the government doesn't regulate this consumer product, and it shouldn't, it definitely shouldn't. Just because the government doesn't regulate this consumer product doesn't mean that you can't fight bad journalism with good journalism. Mark Schuster, what are the standards that ought to be applied to uh, news as we know it now uh, so that we can have something to uh, compare it to and presumably make it better? <laughs> That's a very hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, those standards or some version of those standards are, are being taught in newsrooms and taught in journalism schools. And, and you know, a lot of people have intuitions about um, what they are. Uh, I, I, th I think it's still and it's fair to say that, um, I mean, it, it's not a matter of not knowing what good journalism is, although there are a variety of good journalisms. Um, and I, I I would take today's um, LA Times, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, even my own San Diego Union Tribune over um, the way they did news 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, w without question, although I just glanced at the content analysis and made, um, uh, that, that the committees uh, commissioned, and I may have to revise that a bit. But, but the, the best of today's best journalism, it seems to me, is, is far superior to what we've had in the past. Um, it, it's just that the, the ordinary fare that people get is not the newspaper, it's television. Um, and, uh, and I'm truly not sure how to make television news better. I, I, I didn't want to say that embarrassment, the power of embarrassment has, is, is pointless. Uh, uh, I just think it's, it's difficult. I'm I mean, just saying it's not simply social embarrassment. It, 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 the fact is the reason that General Electric and its light bulb company has a very responsive consumer complaint phone line and a very significant and very determined quality control system for its light bulbs and its refrigerators is that they need to do that in the marketplace and they need to do that to preserve the General Electric brand. NBC has nothing like that. There is not a phone number you call at NBC where you will get the response to a product complaint the way you will if you don't like your light bulb or your refrigerator. None of these people uh, it, it would, Sorry, they, they would all worry that their brand would be tarnished, that their business would be hurt if they were accused and found guilty of polluting. Then the question is, can you make the argument that some of the things they do are toxic and therefore are polluting people's minds or well, society? And if you can, you have a compelling argument, a compelling business argument for why they, for why they might change. And it, 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 it involves shame, but it involves much more than, more than that. Okay, but, you know, but you're going to measure pollution. But how do you measure 
the toxic nature well, of, of news, particularly if, they, if, if it could be argued that the reason the news looks the way it does is that this is what the focus groups tell us the audience wants. Yeah, but you, you, you do it through complaints. If somehow you could translate some of the survey research about the press, about the public being angry with the press, and a bill of particulars about what they're angry about, and you can translate that into that that is harming you, your business, your brand, your news brand, then you might you know, have some effect on people. I think also on a very human level, if you could start asking people, if you have news directors, as Steve and the others were here today, and you start asking them specific questions about why you did things, and they expose themselves to this kind of a forum and other forums, you're going to change their behavior. You're going to force them to think and maybe present a little counter pressure to some of the daily pressures of the, the real problem in journalism is not that people are sitting there scheming about how I can screw the public today. Uh, they're always thinking about how they can maximize profit. It's true. But the real problem is mindlessness. It's people who do things by a formula that they think this is the way you do it, this is the else success. Is doing it. Everybody's doing it. God, if my competitors are doing it, I gotta do it. And somehow you gotta enlarge force people to think and reflect a little more than they you do, know, and it's, it's very hard. You know, the, we're sitting here right now with really terrific stuff that really answers your question. I mean, I, I don't know if it's the question about, you know, what constitutes something that, you know, makes you, you know, a toxic polluter, but I think this stuff that has been done is really terrific. And I say that knowing that every single entity named in all these things can produce a 50-page memo explaining why this is statistically wrong and how it's biased and it's screwed up and everything else. The only thing about it is it's better than anything else that's been done and it's a terrific step forward. Now, if two days ago the New York Times had done a story um, the day before the 75th anniversary party of Time Magazine, uh, which Ken and I enjoyed last night, uh, that Time has gone from 1977 to 1997 from 26.9% to 5.8% in terms of um, its cover stories for policy and ideas, it would have been a little bit embarrassing. Someone would have looked at that. Sure. And maybe they'd be thinking the next time. Maybe, now, I'm not saying that necessarily makes it, a, it certainly doesn't make it a bad magazine. I actually think it's a terrific magazine. But raising those kinds of issues, those kinds of questions, really helps. Uh, Mike Schuster, you talked a little bit about um, how much easier it is to force Detroit to require seat belts. Uh, are you suggesting some sort of regulation? Is there any way that? the public ownership of the airwaves can be asserted, or are we so far beyond that, that, that and particularly when you go to cable and the public doesn't own that, um, is there any, any room at why, all? Why are you picking on television as the bad guy in all this? Because it was as my understanding that to was the topic of the, uh, of the day. But, but I'm not, uh, you, you, it's as if newspapers are all good, television no, no, is no, all no. bad? Yeah. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, I, I didn't mean to, be unnecessarily narrow, and that was the reason. I thought that was the We'd be perfectly so, happy to pick on television if you want, but <laughs> we don't have to. Well, let me ask that, that one question, and then we can go on to the broader subject. That's fine with me. Well, uh, though I'd add, I think there is a reason, there are several reasons to pick on television. One, it's worse, and two, more people watch it. Um, uh, which is not to say the newspapers are, are um, uh, sanctified. Um, I, I don't see how in, in the American First Amendment tradition the government can be very much more aggressive than it is, although in the broadcast area there may be some, there may be some room for, um, and, and I just, I disclaim any expertise on, on regulatory policy. I don't know uh, how you might do that. Um, uh, I, I, I w I'm, here, here's a modest proposal. Suppose, suppose the, the, uh, a local news council or a local set of um, uh, journalists, journalism school deans and whatnot said, um, we, we think that the very least local television can do uh, is to devote at least as much horse race coverage on October of even numbered years to local politics as to local sports teams. Um, that, that would seem like, a, you know, the, uh, if a local television station has some commitment to democracy, that, that, that would be an embarrassable proposition. 
Um, I did see some data on local uh, Los Angeles coverage of the 1996 races, and I believe, uh, I don't have this exactly right, but I think there were four stories, four stories among the three network affiliates in the whole season on congressional races. Well, Congress is hard to cover on television, but the result was they didn't cover it at all, essentially. Um, could, could, you, could you embarrass people on, on that? Um, maybe. I mean, I think there are, there are some things you, you, you could do. Uh, for instance, uh, there, there are newspapers uh, and insti journalistic institutions around the country that are trying to plug into the new media uh, uh, and doing, I mean, Time Warner has a News One in, in New York, which is 24-hour local news on cable. They're not searching for a mass audience. They don't achieve a mass audience. Arguably, it, it, it adds a very good coverage, much better coverage of the city, and it's intelligent. And hopefully at some point they'll make money. Uh, there are 29, at least 29 of these, at least on my last count, of these 24-hour cable, local cable news around the country. One of the things that some communications companies, like Cox Communications is doing, the Tribune Company is doing, is they're trying, in those cities where they have newspapers, to try and create multimedia newsrooms. That is to say they have both, they create a 24-hour cable news that's dedicated local. They do radio, they do broadcast television, and they do online newspaper. And it's all in the same newsroom. And so what you, you, what you then do when you think about it, you are sharing the information, so it's just, you're sharing the resources, which is an idea you had before, uh, the newspaper reporters are helping the, the broadcast and the cable and the radio, uh, w which gives them a coverage they wouldn't normally be able to afford. And if you think about the staff of over 50 for local staff of the LA Times, if they had something like that, what that might do in this community. But in addition to that, it means that they break, if a story breaks, they're putting it on their online right away. You're getting instant access and you can call up their library and get other information. So that potentially becomes a very exciting uh, potential way of, of, of providing you with the news you, you, know, you want to retrieve when you want to retrieve it and giving us a more, more depth of coverage. But let me tell you the conundrum. When you look closely, for instance, at CLTV in Chicago, 24-hour cable news, Chicago Tribune, which covers DuPage County in the suburban crucial battleground area, the way, say, Orange County is for the LA, one of the crucial battlegrounds for the LA Times. They do, in a 24-hour period, eight live half-hour newscasts. And all the rest of the 24 hours, they repeat those half-hour newscasts. At 8 o'clock in the morning, they have two reporters working. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, in prime time for them in terms of reporting, they have three reporters. So you tell me what kind of depth of coverage you're going to get from three reporters throughout the course of a day. Each do an average of one story, right? No, they actually do an average of one story. But they're presumably stories. using the, you know, the Trib stories, too. Yeah, but the problem is that they're trying to create their own local feel and saying they're, they're doing, they're actually sharing a newsroom with the suburban DuPage County edition yeah. of, the, of the Tribune. They ha they've worked in, in terms of food and stuff like that, but they don't want yeah. hard news. What they really want is softer stuff. Mm. And so, in other words, the opportunity is there to reach readers who don't normally read, people who don't normally read newspapers, to reach a new audience, to go online, to do it through new media. The question is, will you do what News One Time Warner is doing in New York, which I think is a much better model for local news, than, or do what they're doing in Chicago? Let me put the dean to work. Uh, don't you think we should get some questions from the audience? Uh, time is running short. Uh, you all have been sitting around here for a long time, and uh, I think have lots of things to ask. Um. Mm. I just wonder, and I uh, direct this to all of you, uh, if there's a little, if there's maybe an overconfidence that the market can solve all the problems created by the market, and uh, there's usually almost an immediate writing off of any sort of public solution, any sort of government solution, along the lines of uh, um, quasi-public television like BBC or French television, and I know that's uh, that's not um, the popular. Uh, popular currently in the, in, in the United States, but should we write that off? Can we really have uh, multi-perspectival news along the model that Herbert Gans talks about, where we really get um, um, 
all the news out there and some that's not uh, uh, profitable. Well, that, you, do uh, have, you do have multi, you know, whatever else you want to say, you have, lot, you have lots of different kinds of news on lots of different kinds of cable channels and lots of different kinds of right. community newspapers. The government as a solution is the, it, it, it just couldn't be worse. If you think about it, the, um, the, the problem you have uh, with Jesse Helms, you know, seeing something in an art museum that he thinks is outrageous and doesn't like, and, and, and his hook into that is, that that museum of the artist has gotten some kind of a government grant. I mean, you would have that problem all day, every day, no matter what. It, it's just awful. And by the way, nonprofit entities, as a rule, whether it's public television or foundations or governments, you know, they don't do good work in anything. But they certainly don't do good work in in terms of hardcore journalism. I don't think it's true either, by the way. Where'd well, you come up with that idea? I, I hate... You've been flying hate, too long today. I hate charity television. I really do. Before he was a capitalist, NPR, he used to believe well, it. NPR is good. <laughs> yeah, before I got mugged, I was like, yeah. Well, what about advertisers that, that uh, refuse to support magazines or, uh, by extension, broadcasters well, that uh, they don't like the stories? Audience. What's the difference between that and Jesse Holmes? Well, the, there's a very big difference because it's not... Uh, it, it is eminently solvable if you have an audience. You know, advertisers can, uh, you know, the fact is that um, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times do all kinds of, you know, stories that advertisers have to hate, but they have an audience. Yeah, I'm not saying, let, let, you know, this is like talking about, you know, uh, the democratic process or democracy. What I'm suggesting is this is the least bad way to set this up. And it has all kinds of problems, but the alternatives, I think, are, are, are just... Uh, I think are unthinkable. I, I share, Steve, I, I don't think it's practical ter in terms of government support, particularly since you have so many news sources now, you'd never get public support. I don't mean Jesse Helms, I mean the public would say that's not a useful expenditure yeah, of my, my money. But, but actually one of the potentially encouraging things, as you do more narrow casting, that is to say, as you do more cable and, and you have more choices, including the digital choices that are coming on, going to be coming online. Or online. You don't need that mass audience anymore. And one of the attractions for advertisers is that they don't have to spend to reach everyone in the city when they only want to target a small audience. They can just target it. So you can get advertising revenues you're not getting from smaller businesses, from businesses who want to focus. And you don't need the kind of mass audience. So you can risk boring people. But I'll tell you, we shouldn't avoid one important subject here. It's easy to blame the public, and I would. And I know there's survey research that, that says that. But you can't stop there. Ultimately, the people in journalism have to be prepared to say, and there's no way to avoid this, it seems to me, I am going to do what I think is important and good. And sometimes I'm going to have to tell you, dear public, I'll try and make it interesting, as Steve said, and I think you can, okay? But sometimes I'm going to have to tell you, eat your goddamn spinach. Because this is important for you to have to be a citizen in a democracy. And if you're not willing to do that, then we should get another business. And, and if, if and you have to do, if you can't do that, we should get another business. Just to respond once more to this question, sure. and some of those journalists who are saying that might be working for public broadcasting. But I'm, I, Fine, but I, uh, fair enough. But I think Ken's right. There is a, you know, what Rupert Murdoch says is, um, you, know, you know, the ruling of, uh, you know, the elites who want to pick things. You know, elitism is also called leadership. It's also called editing. Or Every editor on the planet sits there and decides this is something people should read and this is something they don't need to read or it's not important for them to read. Um, and that, you know, editing and journalism involves leadership. And the most successful businesses on the planet, by the way, are also those where the, uh, the people running them are always thinking not simply of what customers want today based on some, you know, stupid focus group, but what do I think I can create that customers will want if I create it? Let's go back up here. Right. My question is quite simple. Uh, do you think this confusion between news and entertainment is an American phenomena? And if yes, is there anything the American journalist who boasts so much about the First Amendment uh, can learn from foreign journalists? Uh, well, having spent some time in England and read the English press the way they cover the, the royal family, I would not say it's an American phenomenon at all. In fact, I think we do a better job than they do in some respects. And clearly we do a better job at entertaining news. I mean, our news is 
um, is better, that is to say it's worse. Uh, <laughs> in, in I don't know, I, 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 I sort of hate the distinction between, quote, news and entertainment. The only distinction I've ever been able to figure out is a, is a distinction of motive, which is to say if your only purpose in putting on a television program or, or printing something is to sell the most copies you possibly can or get the most viewers you possibly can no matter what, I guess you could say then you're in the entertainment business um, and if your purpose is to do something in addition to that, such as tell people something you think they should know, then maybe you're in the news business. But I'll tell you something. We used to apply for press credentials uh, for Court TV, and occasionally we'd get turned down because some judge or something would say, well, you're an entertainment channel, not a news channel, and it would drive me totally up the wall. And we'd write uh, legal briefs explaining why we were entertain you know, why we were news and not entertainment, and then I would end up tearing up the briefs because I hated doing that because I was asking a judge to make a value judgment about us that was good instead of his bad value judgment. And I just hated the idea of government making those judgments. Um, it's a, you know, one person, you know, I'm entertained by watching Nightline and C-SPAN. Does that make it entertainment? I don't know. And, and news and entertainment are, are mixed, I think, e everywhere. I, I, I'd say, though, there, there is an American uh, uh, tradition th that is more pronounced in that respect, um, the, the low-life London newspapers notwithstanding. That, um, that that goes goes way back. Um, one sure. quick quick interesting example I think is is uh, interviewing as a practice of daily journalists began in the United States. The the British and the French in the late 19th century thought this was this was absurd, uh, and they you know journalism should be essays. That's what they thought. Um, and party pronouncements and so on. And here the Americans were going off and interviewing public officials. And that was an invasion of privacy and it was a concession to democracy and all this terrible stuff. N now we all do it. Let me, while we're taking the next question, add to the panel by having uh, Mr. Rosenthal and Mr. Frumpson come up and, uh, and join our other, uh, our other panelists. Jeff? Um, I just have one. Um, Question for Mr. Hi. We're not done yet. Oh, we're going into the second. Go ahead. Stage while we're doing the first thing. Um, my question is for Mr. Brill. Um, my question is, um, are you expecting to um, make money <laughs> from this magazine? And um, do you concern about the neutrality of your magazine? And um, yeah, how do you finance your magazine? Well, the, the way that question often gets asked is, well, if you're going to be the watchdogs, you know, who's going to watch you? And that's a good question. And the way I have always started to answer it is I've, I've talked about the very aggressive policy we've had, we had internally at Court TV and at the American Lawyer about seeking out um, uh, people who thought we had made mistakes. And um, as Steve Cohn knows, we would always investigate those complaints you know, independently. And I said, you know, people will read us over the months and years and they'll decide we have integrity. And then I realized that was a pretty lousy answer. Um, so I actually came up with a new answer. Um, Two weeks ago, or a week or two ago, um, I uh, made an agreement uh, with uh, Bill Kovach of uh, the Neiman Foundation, and also one of uh, the chairs of, of uh, this group, to be, in effect, um, if you can believe it, our Ken Starr. Um, and this is either a very good idea or a really I terrible idea. On no, I don't think he, th he actually bridled at the suggestion. But here's what he's going to do. Um, he has a contract with us for two years um, wherein he will take any and all complaints that we get or he gets and we will, we will put a notice of this arrangement you know, far forward on a right-hand page of the magazine every issue so people can complain to him as well as complain to me. And he will have um, the ability to investigate any complaints about stories we run independently. And he will also have the ability and the authority um, to publish in our magazine as many pages as he wants to publish saying whatever he wants to say about those complaints. Um, the only right we will have is we will have some right of reply, but then if we reply, he gets the last word. So he can reply to our reply. Um, so that's how we're going to attempt to have somebody independent of us watch us. The other part of the question was, do you expect to make any money? Yeah. I do everything that I do with the expectation that we will sustain ourselves in the free market. You bet. Go ahead. Ken, you mentioned um, 
making, there might come a time where the news directors need to step their foot down and say, look, public, you're going to eat your spinach and we're going to give you what you need to know. Well, is it going to do the public any good, giving them what they need to know if they're not going to watch it? If they're just going to flip the channel to the Jerry Springers or the other? You know, ultimately, you, you come down to, that's why I said it, it, you, could, you could operate on the assumption that the public bears a measure of responsibility, and I think they do. Uh, but it seems to me that's not the operative truth that you should operate and be moved by in journalism. The operative truth is, is a, a faith that you have that you can approximate as the truth and present it to the public, and the public will do with it what they will, but they will get it. Now, your job is to try and figure out how to get it to them. Now, if you have, a pro if you have this problem, which we do in this country, increasingly fewer and fewer people are reading newspapers. If you're in the newspaper business, how do you address that? Well, the new publisher of the LA Times, Mark Willis, is arguing that he's going to increase the circulation by 50%. I think he's smoking pot. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, shoot for the stars. Maybe you'll hit the top of the trees. It's not so bad. He has done a lot of controversial things there, but he has a lot of support in that newsroom right now, in part, part because he's communicated a faith that he believes that you can find readers and you could do good journalism and still find readers. And I think you have to have that that belief system, that faith. Now, one of the things you got to do, you got to be smart about it. You got to be a storyteller. You got to figure out how to get a new medium so you can promote. One of the reasons these Cox and Tribune are doing these other multimedia efforts is they figured out this is a great marketing tool to reach non readers. If you could reach online or cable television or radio, people driving across, people don't normally read the paper, and here is the Orlando Sentinel reports today. Maybe they'll stop picking up the Orlando Sentinel. And that's one of the things that... I think your point uh, before, that's really, it's a cop-out to always turn and blame the publishers and the station managers. I think reporters, as you point out, have to really get those uncomfortable stories out there and really make them sing. I mean, there's no reason why we aren't doing a much more aggressive job of reporting what's going on in this country and not just interviewing politicians who are self-serving in their responses to reporters, but getting to the people who are really victimized or the victims of whatever policies reigns in the country at this time. I just think that reporters uh, just have to really face up to the fact that it's their job to get the story. That's right. You know, there's a, there's a sameness about these panels, I hate to say it, and, um, and that is too many journalists on these panels um, like to regard themselves as the victims. They're victims of the marketplace and they're victims of their audience and they're victims, you, know, you know, the audience made me do it. I have to do it. I know it's terrible, but this is what you have to do. Well, that's just, you know, I mean, I think what Ken is saying is it's just not good enough um, at the end of the day. That doesn't mean that um, if, you know, the people working in local news who do stories about talking to the dead are bad people or immoral people or terrible people. It, does, it, that's not a, it doesn't mean they're, it's just they're not, at least in that case, necessarily doing what they should be doing if they want to call themselves members of a, you know, of a profession called journalism. Okay. And quite, aside, quite aside from the politics of what's going on in Washington right now, I doubt very seriously if a station manager, a publisher, or any executive was telling these reporters to forget about double and triple checking sources, producing facts and not rumor, not secondhand and thirdhand rumor and speculation, and leaks from both sides, the White House and the STARS committee. You know, one of the crazy. reasons that, uh, that uh, Murray and I came up here, we were supposed to do a last act, which was synthesis at the end, and I decided I didn't want to yank these guys, these three guys off the stage. And so we diminished our role. Um, and a actually what I wanted to do was ask a question. The question of how do you measure or when do you measure strikes me as a subtext that's come up earlier in the afternoon and also here. Do you evaluate yourself nightly or quarterly? Uh, if the approach that you're taking, uh, if, the, if the criteria by which you're going to judge uh, in content, the product, the, the journalism, uh, if it's going to be, if, if, the, if the news company is going to say, look, I can get a bigger audience tomorrow night doing OJ, and I don't give it damn what you say in content mm -hmm. um, versus the argument if you'll, if you'll give yourself three years to, to judge success and failure and build audience loyalty 
uh, you can go a, a different route. But, but I I'm, wonder if, if, if basically, I'm, okay, but, but the question I guess I'm asking yeah. is, if their evaluation is, look, I don't, you know, you can say whatever you want, Steve, mm -hmm. but uh, each quarter I, I get a scorecard that's more important than the one sure, you're putting content. Sure, and, and it's always going to be maybe for there's some people. No, maybe that's not going to... Because, uh, you know, there, there are degrees and there are shades of gray. I think if you can get that high scorecard from Nielsen and be judged as doing good stuff too, that's even better. I, also, where I don't, in my mind, I, I, I don't picture ourselves as sitting there, you know, being, you know, judges of content. You know, did they, is that a story someone should have done versus is that a story someone should have done, except where, you know, we can just make fun of it, like talking to the dead or something. Um, but I don't want to make those value judgments. I mean, I, I have a right to. We all have a right to. But I, what I'm talking about are the basics, the, the kinds of things, you know, that Murray just talked about. I mean, I'm writing a story about just that, about that, you know, that case, which is the, the, the basics of journalism. I'll come back to what I said before. Is this thing that you say is nonfiction, is it nonfiction? Does that mean, first of all, for starters, is it true? Second, is it influenced by something that you haven't told the audience that it's influenced by, such as an advertiser, such as the fact that we're doing a story on the 5 o'clock news that happens to be a story about how this fabulous, you know, made-for-TV movie we're doing at 9 o'clock actually happened. You know, the real story behind the something that you're going to see tonight, or, you know, or, you know, that's not news. That's, that is promo. Those are the kind, I mean, you can, you can take some fairly objective standards, and I don't want to cast us as saying, you know, this whole magazine is going to be, you know, a scorecard. What I'm saying again is that if we think of this as a consumer product, and it's a very important, we, 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 all of us journalists promise people that at least the first thing we're going to try to do is tell you the truth. And we may screw it up, but that's the first thing we're going to try to do is tell you the truth. And we also say in, if you got a magazine, your direct mail letter doesn't say, and we promise we're going to give you the things we really think that are important as long as we think it'll sell a lot on the newsstand too. I mean, it doesn't say that. Or as long as it doesn't, you know, um, offend any of the publisher's friends. I mean, we say we're going to give you the true story, whether it's a fashion magazine. A fashion magazine says we're going to tell you the truth as we think it is about fashion. It doesn't say we're going to tell you the truth as we think it is about fashion as long as Ralph Lauren doesn't mind. Um, and we're going to cover a lot of that stuff. A kids magazine says we're going to tell you the truth about this as long as, you know, the Toys R Us people like it. Um, but th th there are some basics that you can do before you get to the sort of wonderful debates about how much coverage have you, you know, have you given to this story versus that story. But I think one of the things that, that uh, I, I'm convinced that one of the answers to your question, uh, not, not, certainly not the only answer, maybe not even the main answer, but an answer, is that is that journalistic institutions, print, electronic, have to begin thinking about how they manage. That is to say, one of the weaknesses <coughs> they suffer from is this hierarchical management structure. The great editor imposing his or her will down. And there, you need an editor to come in with a value system and a belief that I think this is important, I have standards, I'm going to drive you. Steve Brill is probably one of the toughest guys in the world to work for. That's why he's a good editor, because he imposes standards. But I think a lot of organizations fail because they don't listen to the smart people they hire. And journalists every day, you have to make a second assumption, not just about the potential intelligence of your audience, but the intelligence of your employees. And you've got to be able to listen to them and get them back. And the hierarchical model of the CEO, that is to say CEO slash editor who comes in and says, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do that, or you tell me, you four, my, my four teammates, what I should do, my four top editors. That's the wrong model. The model is really come into a room, put on the blackboard what you think we should be talking about today, and we're going to devote part of that this day. What, what are the stories we should be doing? What do you think? Kick, you, you have to build in some more leisurely time for discussion. So, because the rest of the day is chasing fires, and you don't have time to think. So that the importance of somehow building in a structure that allows you to reflect so you can do something that is not by, by rote. And you know, there are it. some editors who are like that. Oh, I'm Wonderful. sure. Wonderful. And we just got through judging the Selden Ring Award for Investigative Journalism, which we'll be announcing in, in Washington on April 1st. We had 110 <laughs> entries, 76 newspapers. 
There were many really great, outstanding examples of good reporting. I'm sure if you look behind the reporting, the editors were encouraging that kind of stuff. So I think it does Absolutely. work to it. It has to just have a lot more of it. You need a lot. I wonder if there is a, a self-perpetuating quality to the addiction to infotainment for stations. What I mean by that is, if you filled your newscast with car chases and killer bras and stinky sheets, your audience has gravitated to that, and you've undermined your credibility to say to them, or I wonder if you have, for a moment now we want you to eat your spinach for the next three minutes. Um, that, that the ability to say to them, trust me, this is important, it may not be as entertaining as the previous story, is something that also builds up over time. And if you, if you've basically built an audience that's on something else, around something else, that that's why, that's precisely why they vanish uh, when you say, let's eat your spinach. And then you, then you, uh, you look at your overnights and you say, well, Christ, we're not going to try that again. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And that we, maybe this is what I meant by long term, you, we have to understand more about the audience research that we've got to say, well, wait a second, this isn't a snapshot of the, of the universal public. This is a snapshot of the public that we've built up over the last yeah. five years. Let me go with the other way. I had a, a very interesting experience some years. I saw David Corvo here and, and at his network, NBC, and I was doing my book on television. Uh, the new owners came in, Bob Wright and Jack Welch and General Electric, and they said, let us hire McKinsey & Company to take a look at how we actually cover news and what it costs us to do a story and how many stories we actually assign get on the air, and why don't we have more pool cameras so we could save some money that way and maybe use it to cover things more intelligent. There was a lot of worrying, particularly among traditionalists in the newsroom, that this was a menace, that you should, don't want this information, that these guys are going to just use it to cost cut, and et cetera. And in part, they did that, um, and some of the, the fears were justified. But the truth is, they were right to come in there and try and analyze. And one of the things they discovered is that 50% of the stories that were signed never got on the air. Now, and the average cost them was, if I memory serves, was $26,000 each story. <laughs> so you start saying, hey, wait a second, I am a business, and why can't I do this a little more intelligently? Well, if you, you take that model from the big bad new owners of NBC, which I think was an, a pretty intelligent model they tried to do, and you apply it to some of what we're talking about, let's look at, at, at some different ways of doing things. Um, it may be with new media. Uh, it may be with 24 hours. It may be with the way we organize within the office uh, and get ideas generation. But you've got you've to challenge your basic assumptions, but not challenge the fundamental one, which is that we are professionals. And a professional assumes that we have some body of knowledge that we can say, we think this is important, we think this is not. That's not all we do. We have to entertain them. We have to give them weather. We have to give them sports. We have to give them. It's a supermarket we're offering of choices for people, let, and that's let, legitimate. Let me just say something about the research and that. Quickly, that because question. I'm getting the, uh, the hook here. <clears throat> OK, I want to. No, say it. Say okay, it. I'll do say it quick. It. Um, the, you, know, you talked about the difference between television and newspapers. If every newspaper editor, and indeed every reporter, um, got a report the morning after the newspaper was published that told him or her um, exactly how many people read his story, how many people read to the second paragraph, the third paragraph? How many people read the jump? You'd have newspaper editors saying, my god, we're never doing that Bosnia story again. Now, that is what happens with television. That is one of the pressures. A newspaper is a blended product. But that's the research television has. Now, I have this sort of theory rattling around in my head that there's another kind of research that could be done. Um, all of us instinctively figure that an ad that we place in the LA Times, if we put an ad in the LA Times, it's likely to be believed more than if we put an ad in, let's say, the New York Post. Leaving aside the demographics and the number of subscribers, it's, it's, it feels it's in a more believable environment. To come back to your point about the kinds of stories, it seems to me that we've never been able to study and measure the credibility and believability of environments on either television or in print so that by taking, quote, the high road and doing an 11 o'clock news that is better stuff, is more high road, you might create, you should create, a more credible, believable environment. And the ad 
might actually be worth more money, and that might mitigate against a lower Nielsen, because basically you'd be multiplying your Nielsen rating by what I'll call your credibility rating or something. And that's never been tried or done, and yet we instinctively know, if you're ever placing an ad or reading an ad, you kind of know that that's true. Okay. I'd, I'd, add, an, I'd add another point to that, which is if you added to the overnight ratings the Brill rating, if every day there was a scorecard that said, this is how many stories you got wrong yesterday. Well, but that only works for, an advertiser's not going to care about no, that. No, no, I don't mean for the advertisers, advertisers, but what the news director gets on his desk every morning is the, is yeah. the overnights. The indices that we're looking at increasingly in newsrooms is an economic one, and, and, and decreasingly a journalistic one. And part of it, part of the problem, I, I would submit, is the quality of the journalism criticism is, you know, it's, it's sh oh, well, this is terrible, oh, you're, you're an old, you know, you've yeah. sold out, you've gone over the wall. And very little of it is, you know, what are you actually doing? What's the criteria of judgment? I'm I mean, just saying there's a way you might be able to turn that into some kind of economic measure, mm -hmm. some kind of credibility measure. Well, you know, for years, newspapers beat up on television because they were obsessed by ratings. And suddenly, about seven or eight years ago, they were going to an ASNE convention, and there were the focus groups starting to come up. So newspapers were doing the same, same thing that the television is doing. There's nothing wrong with wanting to know how many people but are how reading do you a really story know? or watching it, a program. In, th in this town, the Nielsen boxes are under 500 boxes to assess what six and a half million people may be lo looking at at any given night. Do we really know? Do we really no, don't know? Don't get online. You I mean, know, if you online ever, is a perfect. If you ever, is a if you really ever looked at that for cable television, it's it's but, it's even more bizarre and yeah. worse. Don't but the fact is, I know that, I know that uh, some of the communication specialists will tell you, will stand behind the the virtues of of monitoring uh, audiences that way. But I really would like to know, for instance, what people are watching, when they're watching it, why they're watching it, how they were selected to get the box in the first place, because they are pre-screened. But the problem is that arguing that that research is not, not very good, uh, you're not going to win because uh, it's better than nothing. And, you're, and journalists, for the most part, offer nothing in return. Simply saying, get out of my newsroom, I don't want to know. Don't, uh, focus groups bad, my instinct good. You know, we're, that's a losing argument. And, we, and we've lost it. Gentlemen, the dean is uh, exercising his authority. We can't have an impatient uh, uh, person uh, over here. Thank you all very much. Join me in thanking a very provocative and uh, very interesting panel. This is, as, uh, as Tom said when we started, this is a part of a continuing discussion that the Committee of Concerned Journalists has going around the country. And I want to thank the committee, the Pew Foundation, which helped to finance this. Uh, this terrific panel that we've just heard, including uh, two members of the panel who were at the Time Magazine Awards last night, I think, and uh, flew out here to be with us, and the other people who came from out of town, David Corvo and others. It's been a terrific day, and thank you in the audience for spending a fascinating day with us. Thank you all.